Good evening. Those of you who are here in the audience now know why they never wrote a song called March in New York. For those of you live streaming, it's a bit snowy, but we have a hearty group that made it here, and thank you for being here. So I think more and more I'm hearing this lamentation. I never thought I'd be living in a time when so many assumptions are under assault. Uh, the scenes out of Ukraine seems something out of a, out of a World War II horror movie. Uh, the evil that we thought we had done away with decades ago are on our TV screens every night. Uh, despite the encouraging news, we're about to, to reach the mark of a million dead from COVID, something that sounds something like more out of the flu epidemic of 100 years ago. And at home, the whole idea of a free society where losers accept the outcome of an election and yield to the victor came under relentless assault a year ago and is now under assault, uh, in my view, from one state legislature after another. While the party of the elected president is, if the polls remain the way they are, in danger of suffering a political disaster, as well as portending the possible return to power of he who must not be named. <laughs> so these times demand some perspective from somebody with a deep knowledge and love of the political process who has seen it as a practitioner and an observer. Lawrence O'Donnell uh, spent years as a Senate staffer, as a key staff member of the Senate Finance Committee, where the sausage is made uh, in the most granular of ways. He was a key player, by the way, in the classic TV show West Side Story, writer, producer, actor, and best known for the last 12 years as the anchor of the last word on MSNBC. Um, he has a unique access to power. President Biden has, has given interviews to him. Chief of, Star of Staff of the White House, Ron Klain, is a, almost a fixture. He brings a blend to this work of gravitas and great good humor, both of which are really needed in these times. So I'm delighted to bring to the stage Lawrence O'Donnell. Uh, can I? Can it's a I cheering break, section uh, here, Lawrence. This can is I break a... the rule of the moderator in chief and go first? Of course. So, we were just backstage talking about things people got wrong in introductions about us. <laughs> and I don't think you even know this because it's one of those things that passes through the brain at such a high speed that we don't catch it. But I was just given credit. <laughs> they know for being part of the creative team of West Side Story. <laughs> and I don't have to begin to tell you how far I am from being able to participate in that. The name of the show, of course, was The West Wing. And here's, here's, <laughs> here's another. I'm leaving now. Here's another uh, exhibit of, of how bad I am at anticipating the future. I remember when I first saw that title on Aaron Sorkin's uh, pilot script, I just thought, I'm the only one who knows what that title means. This, is, this isn't a good title for a TV show. It should be the White House something. That's how wrong I was. So you weren't? I had nothing to do with West Side Story. I've seen it. Uh, uh, I know, loved he, the Spielberg When that guy version. started singing Maria. I... <laughs> no, I have sung Maria, but uh, never right. for a human being to hear it, ever, okay. ever. Well, that just shows you how perceptive I am. But anyway, thank you for being here. So. I want to, just so that you folks know, because this is part of a greater discussion at the Y about the future of the democratic process, and Lawrence and I, I think, mutually agree that our geopolitical expertise in Eastern Europe is somewhat slimmer than what we think we know about politics. We're going to concentrate on the home front, but begin with Ukraine in this way. Um, so the president imposes sanctions and warns us that we, we're going to take a hit for this. Mm -hmm. According to a recent poll, 60% plus of Americans say they're willingly will pay for higher gas prices to support Ukraine. I noted in a column that most Americans also say they want to eat more vegetables, exercise more, and watch more documentaries. <laughs> so in other words, I am skeptical that when the, when the uh, impact hits at the gas pump in the grocery store, this is not going to, this is not going to produce a wave of support, they're not going to pull up to the gas up and say that blankety blank Putin as opposed right. to, what, what's your sense of how this may play out 
here? Well, you know, the United States lives in a perpetual misunderstanding about gas prices, first of all. I mean, you know, 99% of the country has no idea that all of those numbers are twice as high in Europe every day of the week, even pre-war. Uh, and so, uh, or that, you know, the federal tax piece within your gallon of gas is 18 cents. They think it's, you know, $2.50 or something like that. And so that if you just got rid of that gas tax, you know, it would be a reasonable number. Uh, and and then, there's, then there's the way the information is conveyed. Uh, so, you know, in LA, there's one particular gas station <laughs> that, has, that always charges like European gas prices. La Cienega it, Boulevard. It, yeah, it's the weirdest thing. No, one can, no one's explained to me why it is, like why that particular place, but they do. And so <clears throat> you could always send a camera out to that gas station, take a picture of those numbers and scare people. And that's what the cameras are now doing. You know, they're looking for the scariest number. And the most of these cameras are local news cameras, you know, along with the cable news cameras. And the local news cameras are not, those aren't the shows that are gonna give you the biggest frame of context on what's happening with gas prices. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's always something that, uh, that the Democrats have to deal with in particular, um, you know, because the Democrats are the ones who actually will once in a great while, it now turns out, raise you know the gas tax. You know, the last time the gas tax was raised in the United States of America was 1993, and the big raise that was hit onto the gas tax was 4.3 cents. And that's indelibly etched in my brain because I negotiated those 4.3 cents uh, with the senator from Montana but, at but the Lawrence, time. But Lawrence, okay on the assumption that this is not going to make its way to the great majority of people. Mm -hmm. I come back to this point. For real, not just at La Cienega Boulevard, these right. gasoline prices are going up. Sure they are. And they're going up, and grocery prices are yep. going up. And the last number for inflation on an annualized rate, 8.8, that's a 9.6% right. rate. My, my point is, I try to look at this and say, well, how does this not drop like an anvil on the head of the president and his party? Well, I, the anvil has a little bit of padding on it because of the war influence, but it, your, the question is, is that padding gonna be there in, in November? I'd, I'd be very concerned about it. Uh, gas prices are scary. They tend not to hurt Republicans, by the way. When gas prices go up and Republicans are running, no one seems to think Republicans are responsible for it. Let me, to get up for, make up for West Side Story, point out, that when uh, OPEC turned the pipes off in 73, that was one of the things that eat, ate away at Res Richard Nixon's approval mm -hmm. ratings. And you remember Gerald Ford's highly successful whip inflation now. Right. Um, the irony here was that when Alan Greens, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, when the new Fed, when Volcker yep. slammed the brakes on, after the recession of 82, inflation eased and right. Reagan was the beneficiary. Right. But what I'm getting, I'm circling around this issue because there's a second one I want to put in and you see where it all fits just incredibly brilliantly together. Okay, good. So you might have thought, one might have thought, that the number of Republicans and conservatives who up till two weeks ago were ecstatic about Putin, including the former president. Right. You know, they, he's smart, he's, it's, he's brilliant, you know. Now they're kind of backtracking like a center fielder who's misplayed a, a fly ball. But I can't, I, I'm thinking this is yet example number 460 of things I might have thought would have been devastating to the Republicans and which has basically not cut. Right. So is that just a fact that this is too complicated an issue that if you come out one night and say, you know, Putin's really bad, that kind of erases what you said the last five years? No, I, I think what we need and what, what the Trump era has invited uh, and I'm not sure we've finished the model yet, or if we will. But we need a new mode of analysis of Republican politics. We used to look at politics, right? We used to, we used to look at it and say uh, the, the same thing, th this thing would hurt a Democrat in the same way that it would hurt a Republican. I mean, an example, an example would be if, let's say, a candidate were, were running for president and said uh, about someone who was a uh, prisoner of war, uh, I prefer the soldiers who don't get captured. 
Now, if a presidential candidate said that, Democrat or Republican, finished, we would have finished as what I thought at Me the too. time. Yeah. He's over, it's dead, it's over, right? Now, what we know absolutely is that a Democratic candidate could never possibly escape that ever, and that would be the end of a Democratic candidacy. And what we discovered in 2015, when Trump said that in his first you know, couple of weeks of being a candidate, is that Republicans are not holding their candidates to the same scorecard. And it didn't necessarily mean that they liked what he said. Uh, and what I started to see over time in, in the Trump rise, about which I was completely wrong, by the way, like couldn't possibly have been more wrong. I'll never forget the moment on Morning Joe when he was at 12% in the polls, and I said with all the authority I could muster, well, he's not gonna get higher than that, and everyone agreed. Uh, but so what I, what I think what we saw was <clears throat> Trump hated the people that those voters hate, that, that the entirety now of Republicanism, the entirety of it is we are against liberals. And so whatever we said yesterday, yeah. two months ago, or anything about Putin or about anything else doesn't matter because she's a liberal and I'm running against her in yeah. Florida. Or, you know, he's a liberal. And that's it. And that seems as a formula to be working for them. I would add one footnote to that, which, which is at the end of 2015, uh, I think it was on Meet the Press where I was with Chuck Todd. He'd come back from a, a rally he said, these people were waiting hours in the cold weather, and there were people in Washington saying, well, they're never going to turn out to vote. And he also, or one of us said, all of the things that Lawrence is referring to, um, and more, you know, the insult to John McCain, the crudity, the, all of it, that th they weren't bugs, they were features. Yeah. And that the, the anger and the contempt and the vulgarity was an asset to enough people to propel him right into the nomination. Right. So I mean, I, one other item I'd give you just from your, all your own memories of this. When John Kerry was running for president, he said a line in a debate which made perfect sense to me as someone who worked in the Senate, which was, I voted for it before I voted against it. They've all done it, which is they voted for the Senate version of the bill, and then it went into conference with the House version of the bill, and it came back a different version, and you had to vote for it one more time in identical form with the House so that the president could have a bill to sign. And at that point, a bunch of people jump off, off the, the ship frequently. So it made perfect sense. You know, I voted for it before I voted against it. He was condemned for that, and they did TV ads with that line and showed him as this, you know, guy who would waffle on anything. And I am certain that the same ad, the same line of attack could not work ever in our current politics against a Republican. Well, that's what get, that's the point I'm making, that if you, if the Democrats put an ad saying, look at all these people who embrace Putin, or for that matter, yeah. embraced every authoritarian, well, uh, uh, which I'm raising that because it's, it's part of the theme that we want to look at. I would have thought, just as you did about the McCain thing, that there would be something, there would be a political liability to constantly be praising uh, people who killed and jailed their opponents, that there's a sort of affection mm -hmm. for a democratic society that is um, mm -hmm. bipartisan. Right. And it, it does appear that, that there is no political cost, at least not yet, for having embraced and uh, as against the sitting president of the United States, the head of, the, of Russia who is uh, embarking on this right. slaughter. Yeah, and political cost, equally assignable to both parties, was one of the things that civilized our politics for a very long time. You know, there, there wouldn't be, uh, you know, pre-Trump, pre there wouldn't be a pro-Putin section of our politics. It didn't exist. There wasn't a pro right. Putin's. It'd be an isolationist wing saying, stay out of it, but there wouldn't that's be pro-Putin. Right, right, that's right. And there, was ne there wouldn't be a pro-Putin, you know, uh, Fox channel. Like, that, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, and, but now it has. And I think the interesting question is, does all of this war imagery, uh, because war imagery on TV does, we, we just discovered from Vietnam forward, it does change people. It does change the way they see something. Uh, will this change... Republican voters who were cheering on 
you know, the Trumpian adoration of Putin and Trump believing Putin over American intelligence about, you know, who interfered with the election and all that. And, and there's, I think there's reason to hope that, you know, of those 75 million voters, if you could change, you know, if you could change the attitude of 5 million of them or, you know, miraculously 10 million of them, that changes your country. Um, I'm going to broaden this out about about the affection for undemocratic leaders mm -hmm. and bring it even closer to home. Um, and one of the things that has thrown me for a loop is I really didn't ever think that, um, that people would seriously entertain the idea that you could overturn an election by the will of a dozen or so state legislatures, that this, would, this was so alien to the to the, I don't know if it's a fiction or the drama we have about the election day and the votes, that this would simply not, not have, have happened. And yet my sense is that among not the complete whack jobs, but quote, respectable leaders, um, they're perfectly willing to say, well, you know what? Yeah, we lost by seven million votes, but you know they came from the wrong places, mm -hmm. probably corruptly counted by you know who in Philadelphia, Atlanta, right? Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Mm -hmm. um, and yet now you have, across the country, um, candidates competing for the key jobs, secretaries of state, canvassing boards, whatever, who believe that Trump, or say they believe that Trump won, and appear to be willing to do everything from changing who can vote to how the votes are counted to make sure that this steal doesn't happen again. Yeah, and the difference will be <clears throat> if the full architecture of the plan is in place, all of those choices will be legal. Uh, there was some really fanciful writing uh, before the last election about how, for example, the Pennsylvania legislature could simply seize back its power to name electors uh, and that they would do that, that that was utterly nonsensical uh, because uh, through an act of the legislature, they had given that power uh, to the voters, as, have, uh, as has happened in all 50 states. Uh, and Pennsylvania had a Democratic governor. So the idea that this Republican legislature was going to instantly pass a bill giving them, you know, this electoral power and a Democratic governor was going to sign it, it was just all idiocy and it was never going to happen. So every one of those scenarios was fake in the last time. And, but what they're working on now is making them all legal. So there are these attempts in some of these legislative exercises by Republican legislatures to enable that, to enable the legislature to say, ah, no, we don't, we don't like this count. We don't, uh, here's, here's who the electors are. And, and if that's legal, you know, then it's all over. Uh, but just to be clear, no state legislature, not only has no leg state legislature done this, but there are at least people now in Palo, Republicans in Wisconsin and Arizona saying, ain't no way, no right. how, we ain't right. going to do this. Right. And so th and you but, did, what you did see last time were individual Republicans when basically at the point of being asked to commit a crime, they said, no, we won't commit the crime. And so one of the efforts has been to just remove that threshold of crime. Like, well, what if, this, what if this particular thing isn't a crime? What if that isn't a crime? What if that isn't a crime? That's the way to look at what these Republican laws are doing. They're, they're decriminalizing uh, certain electoral activities that you could do after the votes are counted. Some of them are before the votes are counted, before registration happens, to prevent you from register. But the really, really scary, scary stuff is the after, when in the counting process, what are we legally allowed to do? And that's where they're trying to do you know, right. the darkest stuff. Which, which leads me to raise a lamentation uh, about the party that I can't say you, you well, yeah, I can say you sort of support. You seem to tend ever so slightly to the Democratic I worked on the things. Democratic side of the United States. That's, okay. that's true. So, yes. so okay. Um, on the west side of the... Uh, but I've never, uh, you know, the, I've never been I know, a I know. registered Democrat. Okay. And I remember there was a day in Senator Moynihan's office one time, it was just the two of us, and he was talking about something, and he said, uh, and, you know, young Democrats like you, and it went through my mind, should I tell them? Uh, and, you know. <laughs> okay, but he, this is the part that, that it feels like deja vu all over again, to quote Yogi Berra. So f more than 15 years ago, 
Republicans began a project to take over state legislatures called Project Red Map. Yep. They realized that with a relatively small amount of money, they could get power. And the Democratic response to this was a snooze. They would, you know, because it wasn't exciting. The, you know, the, co the, the cocktail parties on Martha's Vineyard for Hillary Clinton or whoever is much more fun than schlepping through who's going to be the Speaker of the House and, okay. So the de in 2010, the Republicans took over, I think, something like 18 state legislatures. And there began, you know, the entire pushback on things like abortion, on gay rights, on how you fund schools, and now on how you teach race. Now we learn that the democratic response to what you just talked about is the same thing. They are underspending. They are not contesting nearly as much as, the, as Republicans are in Secretary of State races. We saw what happened in Georgia when the Republican guy said to Trump, no, I'm not helping you. Mm -hmm. So as somebody who's been up close and personal, is there something about the Democratic Party that simply uh, it's not it, it's not malfeasance, but it's nonfeasance. It's a failure to understand the, the you know the guys coming down from over the mountain with the spears and the arrows, and saying, well, as long as we have the presidency, we're fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I think I I know I think I I have a feeling about what's happened, and and I understand it. Um, and the the people who I absolutely don't blame are those contributors at the fancy fundraisers you're talking about on Nantucket or elsewhere, uh, because they actually are not generally offered this mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. there, isn't, there isn't someone who comes in <clears throat> who they know they respect, who says to them, yeah, I, I'm so glad you're going to the presidential candidate fundraiser next week. Let me talk to you about the state legislature in you know, X state and why this is important and what we need. And that has never been assigned in the Democratic Party as a high-level operation. And I, I, I suspect a, a couple of things are at work, and it, and it is the product of, of success and glamour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the FDR, you know, four presidential elections in a row, the Democrats, the, the way they were winning, the margins they had, you know, in, in the, uh, the House and the Senate were astonishing. Um, when I was working in the United States Senate in 1994, uh, the Republicans won the House. And I don't say they won the House back, because it was the first time they'd won the House in my lifetime. In my lifetime. Close. Yeah. 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 So 40 years. And so, um, so when you have the House of Representatives for 40 years, and it isn't contested one of those years. Not one of those years was it contested. Tip O'Neill had margins of, of Democrats that he didn't know what to do with. You didn't have to vote. I mean, all of the Southern Democrats didn't have to vote for any of the liberal stuff because they had so many votes. You, you, we don't need you. Don't worry about it. Um, and by the way, when the Democrats lost the House in 1994, not a single person predicted it. No one. Not one pundit. No one. I if have, I, I, if I that pundit predicted it, there would be a statue built to that pundit now. Not one person. Uh, the Democrats also lost the Senate. And on the day the Democrats lost the Senate, they had 57 Democrats in, in 1994. And we thought that was just the natural order of yeah. things. It was just like, well, yeah, we got 57. We've got, you know, Richard Shelby in Alabama. We've got all these guys in Oklahoma and Louisiana. They're all, you know, Democratic members of the Senate. Well, you know, the, Richard Shelby is still in the Senate. He's a Republican. He switched parties in, uh, after the Democrats lost in 1994. So, and so this long run of dominance in Washington okay. was just, an, and glamour, which was a, the JFK glamour thing affected every single Democratic presidential race after that. Because once once you've seen the Beatles, you know, you just, you just, that's all you want, you know? And so they were always going for that glamour candidate. And that's what blinded them to what was going on in the lower levels, yes, I think? Yes, okay. because, because glamour, uh, you know, that glamour burst in 1960 was truly, it was like heroin to the political system on that side. And it, it, it established the belief that you could just 
you could just go with that. You know, the, the movie star thing. It's, it's, like, it's like a football team that just only wants to throw 50-yard passes. This is a good segue into, into where I want to go now. Um, if I, having gotten your CV wrong, I want to make sure I'm right about this. I have read that you've described Joe Biden's first year in office as highly consequential, almost, almost equal to the great changes that we've seen in during the New Deal and Great Sight. Is, is that a fair? I think it's second. I think it's second. Uh, if you're looking at it in terms of actual presidential accomplishment, it is second only to, uh, to Roosevelt. It's a distant second to Roosevelt. So it's higher but, than the Great Society that produced Medicaid, federal aid, Medicare, yeah. federal aid education? Well, in, in the following way, okay. Um, the Johnson was working on the, a, a tremendous kind of momentum off of November 22nd, 1963. The, the assassination of JFK Mm -hmm. gave Johnson a kind of momentum that wasn't in any real sense earned. He also wasn't elected, you know, uh, uh, to put it. And so, so then, you know, you, you get to, uh, you know, but if you're, if you're talking about the first 12 months of a presidency, which is, which is what we're talking about, yeah. I mean, the okay. first 12 months of Johnson, you know. And, and when, by the way, when you get to Medicare and Medicaid, there was no such thing as a congressional budget office. No one had to tell you how much it cost. No one knew how much it cost. They didn't want to know how much it cost because they couldn't pass it if they did. And there were no Senate rules comparable to the way they are now. None of that stuff. Okay. And so it was a much easier world. Right. So, so that brings me to the, I don't know if you want to call this the conventional wisdom or the assessment from people other than yourselves, which runs, and you only probably heard this about 50 times, but right. the first time on this stage. So. Uh, Biden comes to power uh, having won, in electoral terms, an extremely close election. Yep. Never mind the 7 million vote plurality, 44,000 votes in three states, and it's, it's in the House of Representatives. Uh, the Democrats lose a dozen seats in the House. Uh, they have more money than God in the Senate races, and they, they only get the Senate by, by the skin of their teeth, 50-50. Mm -hmm. And then Biden, yielding to the progressives, decides to govern as though he has Roosevelt and Johnson's majorities puts together a plan that, is, that he knows he can't pass because he's been told this by Senator Manchin, you know, and it's in him five ways from Sunday. And the solution from the progressives to all this is how an economist fixes a leak, which is first assume you have a wrench. Um, and the, so the question is obviously, I, was this not a case of overreach, of a strategy that instead of saying, I know what I have and I'm gonna get as much as I can to overpromise and underdeliver? You must always, always overreach on a legislative agenda, always, because you will never get what you reach for, never. So if your reach is to here, you're gonna get something in here. If your reach is to here, you're gonna get something in here, okay? So if Biden had said, all I want is that infrastructure bill, he wouldn't get it. So um, the, I'd, never, I, I'd never understood how they thought they could get both bills. I sat there in, a marvel at the idea that you could do this sequentially. There's a million dynamic reasons in the legislative process why you can never do that. No one had ever tried to do it before. However, however, uh, Manchin, who was the guy to watch, actually did say that he was absolutely okay with a 1.9 and then a 1.7 trillion dollar version of this bill. Uh, and then it was Manchin who pulled back. And I've got to say, I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen a senator with that kind of experience and that kind of situation uh, make a deal with Chuck Schumer in writing, his own handwriting, this, this is my number, this is where I am, give it to him on a piece of paper, and then retract that deal. I've never seen that before. So they came you know, within one or two votes of doing the impossible in a 50-50 Senate. No president has ever governed with a 50-50 Senate as long as Joe Biden has. There uh, is nothing more difficult than not, trying to do that. I would say not since Eisenhower in 52 to 54. Nine senators died in that period and they kept flipping the majority. Oh, they did? Yeah, oh. but, but it is a different era. So yeah. even though the majority flipped, yeah. John, Lyndon Johnson, was, who was the minority, said, yeah. no, keep the committees. We, we're, we got right. other things to do. Right. It was just a different. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. But it was, I've looked that up because I, yeah. One of the things that, that that keeps me up at night, more or less, is in a 50-50 Senate where there are 15 or so Democrats who come from states with Republican governors, uh, 
a stroke of fate takes that majority away. Yeah, and 50 Democrats who have cardiologists. That's so what I mean. Just, yeah. one, of, one of whom has just come back from a stroke. Yeah, so, it's terrifying. Yeah, it's okay. absolutely terrifying. And when you work in the Senate, one of, those, the, one of the things that, that's going through your mind all the time, uh, this is not a public discussion, but there, it is a question, of, especially when it's really, really close, like that 51 or 50, is someone dying? That does go through your mind. And, and I worked there, and I, I don't know, what I worked there for seven years, and I, and I saw two die in plane crashes in seven years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just remarkable. Well, as I say, that one, that one uh, legislative session, nine died. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't mean to be that grim, folks. Um, but I this does not know that. But this, uh, there you go. You know, if, when it comes to useless <laughs> not use information, I'm folks, stealing it. I I'm your that. guy. <laughs> you want to know the you want to know the controllers race in New York City in 1957? <laughs> I'm your guy. But uh, but let's. Uh, you'll be safe in the park every night after dark with Lefkowitz, Kalhuli, and Fino. That was the 1961 <laughs> Republican. Now let me get back to more serious stuff because one of the things that is. I'm just wondering. You know, what else you're, could be occupying that space in your Yeah, me mind? too. <laughs> that, that has, like, what that like, like what show you worked on <laughs> right, on yeah. NBC. Yeah, I, yeah, believe me, I've been down this road, Lawrence. It's, uh, you know, but, but as we turn to the question of whether or not um, the Democratic Party is, is going to stave off a disaster in November, which would put Republicans in power at all the levels, and in both of our views, I think it's fair to say, make the democratic election of the next go-round problematic. One of the issues that, is, that we've heard, and this goes back as long as I can be in, remember being in politics, is the issue of the, the Democrats' problem with culture versus policy. Uh, the Democratic uh, Congressional Campaign Committee issued this kind of Jeremiah saying to Democrats, uh, our polls show that people think you're condescending, that you're preachy, that you don't respect their different values, um, Elaine K. Mark and Bill Galston, who wrote a very influential piece 30 years ago about the Democrats losing this issue, have just come out with a new one making the same argument. Steve Bullock, the former governor of Montana, says, you know, you Democrats back east, you don't understand Democrats in places like Montana. We used to win Senate seats in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Indiana. We've lost these people on grounds of culture. They don't care if we have a five-point program on college education because they don't think we care about them. Um, what's your take on that? You know, I, I think it's a really, uh, it's a difficult thing to manage. You know, e even if you come from the perspective of those analysts who see it that way, and you then said to them, okay, you're in charge. Go ahead. You're in charge of the, uh, I don't know, you're, chairman of the Democratic Party, or you, you're running the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, you're in charge of it. And Speaker Pelosi is giving you full authority to tell them all what you think they should say. Um, it's, a, it's a big group of people. Um, they're all going to end up saying what they want to say. Uh, there's none of that you know, party whip stuff that uh, gets to control people the way you used to be able to control people. And then there's going to be an iPhone in front of them Mm -hmm. capturing them saying that thing in Buffalo that you used to be able to say in Buffalo and nobody knew, you know? And, uh, and so that, that problem, you know, is just uh, unmanageable. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I've never seen anybody able to get the Democratic Party as a group of either senators or House members uh, on a so-called same page. I, no, but I've never is, seen it happen. But there is one Democrat who was facing the same issue after having lost, the Dem party had lost three landslide presidential elections. And whether he was speaking out of the deepest level of sincerity or the deepest cynicism or a mix, Bill Clinton understood this problem. And in one of his first speeches, he said, the voters trust us neither with their money nor our safety, their safety. Mm -hmm. and." You know, he did things that a lot of people felt really bad about. You know, he campaigned behind the blue wall of cops, went back to Arkansas to preside over the execution of a of a mm -hmm. prisoner, um, talked about the brain dead policies of the Democratic Party. What I'm getting at here is, I understand. Joe, I saw yes, the State of the Union speech. Joe Biden said we shouldn't defund the police, but 
One of the famous incidents in American politics, the sister soldier moment, was when Bill Clinton attacked a rap singer who had advocated violence against the police. And a lot of people thought that was a quite deliberate way of saying, I'm a white Southerner who will not be intimidated by a black rap artist, or for that matter, by Jesse Jackson. Now, I don't know how you feel about what Clinton did, whether you agree with my assessment or have a different view, or whether you think that Biden needed, having won the nomination as the one more, most centrist, old-fashioned kind of candidate, had to govern that way too, in clarion terms, saying this is not who we are as a party. We are a party that tries to make life better for people who need help from the government. Well, I've never heard um, a Democratic leader or a Democratic president actually say that line, which is incredibly clear. This is not who we are as a party. Do you think uh, it's, do you think it's- Joe Biden easy? did say, you know, fund the police, but he didn't say that's not who we are as a party. Um, Bill Clinton, for all of that, in 1992, won the presidency with 43% of the vote. So, you know, I-, I Well, with, with Perot, he got 55% right. of the two-party vote. But with, with uh, you know, it, it, that's 1992, you know, and it's not the same place, and Bill Clinton couldn't possibly, possibly get a presidential uh, nomination in this party, uh, if you, if it, I mean, just yes, 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 sure. I mean, just consider one circumstance. I mean, just imagine, you know, the Jennifer Flowers press conference, which occurred in this city in 1992 during the presidential campaign. Imagine that uh, in the Me Too era in our politics. You know, so it's like, it, it, it's the whole Clinton, Bill Clinton experience is a kind of ancient history that I don't. I, I, by the way, I used to, I, I agree with those dynamics at that time. Okay, mm -hmm. in 1994, absolutely. Um, it's one of the reasons why the Democrats, led by Joe Biden, in fact, as the uh, judiciary chairman, they in the Senate, they did this big crime bill. It was like the very first thing they wanted to do in 1993 and 1994. They wanted to do this giant healthcare expansion, which was considered, you know, extremely liberal and was a gigantic overreach and got zero. Uh, but they also did, you know, raise taxes and cut spending, did a bunch of things, and a crime bill. And that was to, to go to s directly to that yeah. politics and say, we are tough on crime, and here's the money for 100,000 police officers. And I don't think Democrats from that day forward have ever gotten credit anywhere for well, the, the funny tough thing on is by, crime part. By 2020, they were all apologizing for that and electing progressive DAs, and then the crime rate started going up again. And if you want to talk about the secret of good comedy, timing, this was unfortunate uh, for them. But the, yeah, I, the example that I had in, in mind, I think, when I mentioned that kind of approach was Margaret Thatcher, um, who, you, who took on her conservative party, mm -hmm. uh, challenged them at, at the most basic level. Mm -hmm. And her famous statement was, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. Right. And my feeling about culture is for all the efforts, the Democrats have never, not for the last several decades. I mean, I have a vivid memory of sitting in, at, at a news at ABC with Dick Gephardt, the leader, Democratic leader of the House, coming in and, yeah. and being asked about this and saying, oh, you know, when the people learn about our prescription drug plan and how we're going to get the kids into college and job retraining, right. they're going to be for us. And, right. and you know, the, the, the formula culture trumps policy, I think is still pretty potent. And the great irony for me is that Biden, who by his own life sort of symbolizes, I mean, you put Biden up against Trump and say, now who's the, who's the family man? You know, who's, who's the guy looking out for the little guy? Doesn't seem Well, that I mean, tough. I would ask about Biden's first year. What did he do that was wildly liberal? This, these, are, um, these are not attacks, oh, these are questions coming out. up. Oh, okay. Is that right? Yes. Um, um, by the way, those of you live streaming, if you'd like to send in your questions, please do. Sorry. Yeah, I, I don't see what Biden did that was wildly liberal or not Biden in his first year. I mean, I've known him, f you know, for mm -hmm. 30 years, worked with him in the Senate. And uh, Joe Biden and every single Democrat, every single one of them, is more liberal than they were in 1992 or 1996 or 2000 or 2004. They're all more in this direction uh, because their view of the problem set 
has sharpened to the point where they think these are the kinds of interventions and things that are needed. And so, you know, Biden got in there and he did an infrastructure bill, uh, which Trump couldn't do and the Republicans couldn't do, which is good old fashioned governance, uh, was never considered liberal governance by anyone. Uh, it used to be highly bipartisan with the Democrats leading the way and increasing the spending side of it and Republicans being sort of forced to go along because they want to get credit for that bridge. Uh, in their in their county or in their state, and now the the Republicans don't even vote for it because they're just going to lie about it. Well, they, like when the when the bridge gets fixed, they just lie about it. But say, nineteen of them that. did vote for it in the Senate. Yeah, but but you know in the House they didn't, and they and the, these House members are Republicans are constantly putting right. out press releases saying the the infrastructure bill, right. and so Biden did an infrastructure bill. Uh, you know he's nominating the most supremely qualified Supreme Court nominee. I've ever seen. I've never seen one more qualified, if you want to start with that standard. Um, you know, uh, he, he reached for this, uh, you know, this big spending version of a social infrastructure bill uh, that they couldn't get, that they pared all the way down to the size that the West Virginia Democrat wanted, which was $1.7 trillion, which, by the way, is huge. It's still gigantic at that number, gigantic. He was in favor of it, and then he said, "Well, I'm not in favor of it anymore." Okay, so I don't, okay. I don't see the wild liberal Biden. All right, um, I think it's what I think it is is it's leakage. It's from the most liberal folks, and there's a spillover. Oh yeah, yeah, you're in the same shop as they are, and she said this, so that that gets. Yeah, yeah I think that's. Uh, and you know, that you know yeah, that's, that and it's to me pretty interesting that yeah. three board of education members in San Francisco were recalled with the active help of the black woman who was mayor of San, of, uh, San, Fran of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've had this notion that Eric Adams, assuming he's not indicted in six months for the friends he hangs out with, and London Breed would make a pretty powerful political argument, this is who we are. We are liberal black Democrats who are want to see the lunacy of changing the name of George Washington School done and we want to see crime stopped. Well, you know, one thing about the changing the names of the schools in San Francisco, none of them were changed. They did think about it, some of them voted for it, and then they went, nope, hold yeah. it, stop. Uh, and they did all sorts of other things having to do with attendance and stuff that bothered a lot of people. Right. But um, Eric Adams is a fascinating case, because this is all imagery that we're talking about. It's all imagery. And he's being embraced by certain people as like, oh, he's the moderate, you know, smart, Democrat, and he's the exact opposite of the defund the police, except for the fact, as New York voters know, that when he was running for mayor, his position was cut the police budget by one billion dollars, 25 percent. That was his position in the primary among these uh, candidates that he was running against, and nobody really paid attention to it. And of course, he's not going to do it uh, because no one was going to do it, you know, right. even if they proposed it. But he did not run against that when he was running against no. Democrats. Well, now he, now he's the New York Post's child. Exactly, yeah. because it's all image. There, there are two numbers from these polls which come out every day and must cause grief in the West Wing. <laughs> the real West Wing. The real West Wing. Two of the numbers that, uh, th that I think would be most chilling was that among Hispanic voters, by nine points, they favor Republican control of the Congress over Democrats. And among black voters, the level of support for the Democrats has dropped 20 points. Mm -hmm. Now, call me madcap, but if November happens with Hispanics voting plus nine for Republicans and blacks voting 20 points less for Democrats than they did, you are talking about a, what, what is the correct earthquake, tsunami, bad asteroid day, collision? But you know, but it would be a very bad day for government in America too. I mean, I, well, that's it, what I'm getting. Unfortunately, at. we can no longer look at this in the way we could in the 90s. In the 90s, you could look at it and as a, you know, the political shift from, you know, uh, you know, George Mitchell being the uh, majority leader of the Senate and Bob Dole being the majority leader of the Senate was a was as small a shift as you could get, you know, from one party to the other. Uh, Bob Dole was a completely reasonable person and, you know, was not there to try to, you know, stop government. And, um, you know, it's disastrous if if uh, if you lose control of these congressional 
chambers uh, to a party that you know doesn't believe in democracy anymore. This is a disaster. Before we turn to questions, since you are um, much in the media, there's a, a kind of permanent rolling debate about the impact of social media on the attenuation of affection for democracy, the willingness to believe that violence is, a, is the way, the willingness to believe that Trump is a legitimate president. Mm -hmm. How much, how, now, I remember after 2016 there was much uh, rending of garments about Facebook, and it turns out that the, Im that the impact on the election was a lot less than people might have thought. But as a general proposition, you know, with a hundred flowers blooming, with this magnificent internet, uh, where there is a obvious um, uh, withering away of, of a shared set of assumptions, has it been has it been good for the process? Has it weakened democracy? Has it done both? I think if you were looking for, I, I, I guess if you were trying to search for the evidence to make the case that it's good for the process, I think that would be a very difficult assignment. Uh, very difficult, because if you, if you look at the process in the era of the ascendancy of this stuff, of Twitter, um, the, it, it's become, it's the worst version of the process that has existed in my lifetime, oh. by far, right, by far. And, and you know, in the 90s, the early 90s, when Newt Gingrich was in the House of Representatives, we thought that was as bad as it could possibly get. You know, we, <laughs> Democrats lost the House in 1994 and Gingrich was gonna be in control. We just thought this is unimaginable, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. You want him back now. Huh? It's a golden age compared to where we are now, right? But it was a pre-Twitter age, right? And a, a pre-social media age. Uh, and so it, it seems, uh, and I think, you know, people are gonna take a few decades to, to get a wide perspective on this to, to figure it out, but it does seem that the, the political health uh, of the United States of America, and, and I don't mean to favor one party or the other in that, in that uh, diagnosis, but the political health of the United States of America was better when there was what you just, that phrase you just used, a shared set of assumptions, and that shared set of assumptions came from a news media that was much smaller it, it, it in the fact in that it was there were three television networks there were you know your local television stations three of them maybe and and then there was your one local newspaper in some cities you know two or three local newspapers and that was it and no one else was pumping stuff into the pumping information into that system and if you looked at the most conservative newspaper and the most liberal newspaper in say you know 1990 uh, or certainly 1960, the difference between them was like was like this big, you know. And the difference between, you know, the most liberal and the most conservative flows of media now are just, you know, mm. bigger than the space of this room. And it, it and it includes utter madness, just utter, sheer, raging insanity. Yeah. You know, like like a cable news guy on Fox saying that if I have to pick, if I have to pick between Ukraine and Russia, then I pick Russia. I mean, that, that's in the news flow now. Yeah, that couldn't be in the news flow in the past. I mean, you want to talk about insanity, how about a pizza place in Washington being the headquarters of pedophiles, satanic right. pedophiles and, who eat children? And people believe I it. I kind of think that pushes it. Yeah. Uh, I lied, by the way, I do have one more question. But you've, you've been down this road. Um, so I noticed a while ago, the 100 and something Republicans signed an open letter saying Trump's no good. And then I noticed that not one of them is an office holder. They're all X. Right. right. And I keep reading uh, about, you know, the, is Trump fading? Is Trump weakening? It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, the big bands are coming back any day now. <laughs> uh, all I know is right now Trump leads this le nearest competitor for the nomination by something like four or five to one. Uh -huh. And it goes back to the very first point you were making. My feeling is for six years this party has, there is nothing at this point, literally, when, that they will not tolerate. Uh, Bill Barr says, I learned that Trump is, went off the rails, is totally unfit for the office, and if he's a nominee, I'll probably vote for him again. Right. So if that's, if that's the state that that party is in, am I wrong in thinking that a lot of this Trump is weakening, watch the primaries, is, is kind of overstated, that he's still yeah, far and away yeah, the I, party? I, yeah, I don't share that weakening thing. I, I mean, I, I, 
I think the, the, it's a big life question for Trump, you know, for defendant Trump. Uh, is he going to be a criminal defendant in, you know, Georgia? Uh, it, it, you know, and, and what does that do to his, his own personal view of his future? Uh, because, by the way, it doesn't stop him electorally. That's right. There's nothing, nothing says you cannot run for president if you're in prison. You can. Hey, uh, the mayor and, of Boston, right. James Michael Curley, served two terms as mayor as a guest of the Federal Correctional right. Institute elected, in Denver. Elected from jail. We yep. were very proud of him. Yep. Um, but um, he did a very Irish thing. He took an exam for somebody to get a civil service job. Right. Come on. That was the, uh, no, no, right. that was the first time. <laughs> right. right. Um, no, Never but, mind. So, Go back so, to Trump. So, yeah, you know, so... You know, if, so Trump, just to clarify, if he is convicted in Georgia, he's never going to he's not going to be actually behind bars ever. They're just going to say to the Secret Service detail, OK, you are now his custodian. You know, instead of an ankle bracelet, you have him. He can't leave mar largo That's how his sentence would work. But, you know, is he going to be a convicted felon in Georgia, you know, for the next election? What does that do? And my answer is and this is crazy. Yeah. My answer is I don't know. Like, like, you know, this we, would make, we don't know. This we, would make a great sitcom. Yeah. And, I'm sorry, uh, you should go back to that you know, and um, President 103456. Right. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's not, it, it's worth noting that the worst thing, it's both the best and the worst, I guess, but the worst thing that ever happened in Donald Trump's life was running for president. You know, he, I mean, look at what happened to his life because of it. Look at how many places he's already a civil defendant in a big way, in ways that can wipe him out, just wipe him out, uh, and possibly a criminal defendant in Georgia. Uh, it was just a, it's, it's the worst thing he's ever done. And, and, and he lost, you know, this second time he lost. He doesn't like losing. So he's got an opportunity, again, to step up and prove that he can lose again. And he's very good at, at coming in second in presidential elections. And, um, and by the way, the only reason, really the only reason there's anything that we call a crisis in American democracy at the presidential election level, the only reason is the idiocy of the Electoral College. If there was no Electoral College, we don't have a problem. There just isn't a problem. The, the Republicans have given up permanently winning more votes. That's the, the most interesting, that, the next time you have, if you have, any of these, a guy like McCarthy on your show, or, or Newt. The question is, you know what's really weird? Is that it, it seems that you are perfectly happy with the fact that you can't win a plurality of the votes. I know it's not constitutionally the way you elect the president. Isn't that a little odd that a political party that from 1952 through 1992 won the plurality, I think seven out of right. 10 times. Right. The only time it won was George Bush's, uh, W. Bush's yeah. second term. Yeah. It is, it is, it's just peculiar. Um, and as I say, I go back to my dog whistle theory that they just describe it to the wrong kind of people voting. Well, right, exactly. And the Electoral College allows you to do that. The Electoral College allows you to just target these voters here in, in these states and get your number and come in second and take the presidency. Yeah, of course, it still doesn't answer the question that Democrats used to win these states or at least be competitive and they're losing these states largely because there are more white working class people than the th theory of ascendancy. Well, you, you also have to look long term at migration, you know, and, and it turns out a lot of the a, a certain kind of kid who grows up in South Dakota who wants to go live in Los Angeles and, or New York or, you know, somewhere else. And so those states, uh, yeah. you know, you're, the people who are left behind are, are who your voters are. Well, but that's not Florida. No. Okay. No. My theory is that George Soros, if he's really trying to buy the election, should simply pay 500,000 Californians to move to Ohio, you know, the Kokodas, Montana. Yep. And, and, and just give them 20,000 bucks a piece. It's a lot cheaper than the money right. that the Democrats raised and wasted in the Senate races right. last time. And in no other country in the world do they have this conversation. You know, we, we were theoretically this model for democracies around the world. And, and you know, we've, that over different periods in our history, we've sent teams of democratic scholars into countries that were forming their first democracies. And they took good notes and they did all these things that we were doing. They liked everything we're doing. And not one of them ever said, tell us about the Electoral College again. That sounds great. Uh, and so it, it, it doesn't exist. Well, anywhere. but not one of those countries was formed by a federation of, independent, of states. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I was an election observer exactly once 
uh, in my life in uh, Azerbaijan. And you know, you'd go around and you'd look at the ballot boxes, you see how they're doing it. You know, and so the best you can do is write a report that says, we did not see any fraud, any voter fraud, any, anything, we didn't see anything. You're not certifying it, you're not saying it was perfect. You know, but you do sign this thing that says, we didn't see anything. And there's a bunch of us, there's dozens of us all over the country and we see different sections on election day and all that and it's, and it's fascinating. If they had ever said to us at the end of the day, you know, the day after the election and, and we're writing this little report that says, <laughs> we, none of us witnessed anything that was wrong. If they said, okay, thank you for signing that. By the way, uh, next month, the electoral college is gonna meet and they're gonna decide. We just would've said, give me that paper back. We're not signing anything here. You got an electoral college, that's crazy. Right. You can't certify that. This is how I feel about the Iowa caucuses, but that's yeah. another story. So we got, um, my rant won't start for another year at least. Okay, so we got a few questions and uh, you know, every once in a while, I've been doing this a long time at, at, the, at this place, and every once in a while I get a question that says, I probably wouldn't get this question posed to you anywhere else. So the question is, did you hear anything about a Russian billionaire putting a million dollar bounty on Putin? No, next question. <laughs> a million, that's the scene from Dr. Evil. One million, million dollars? Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. All right, I just, I just had yeah. to share that with you. Um, you say that Republicans have made their agenda everything against liberals. Wouldn't you also say that Democrats have made their agenda everything against conservatives? No, I mean, Jeff and I can rattle off what the Democratic legislative agenda is. Uh, Mitch McConnell has said specifically out loud, we don't have one. Uh, and we're gonna run without one. Yeah. Our, yeah. our platform is, we aren't them, we don't like them. If you don't like them, vote for us. And so, you know, it, it's, look, I wish it wasn't. It didn't used to be this way, okay? Uh, you know, when Bill Clinton got up and gave his State of the Union address ab uh, about, you know, here's my health care plan, and he detailed every little bit of it. You know, here's my plan, here's what it is. Bob Dole didn't, got, he got up and he ridiculed it with a diagram, diagram that made it look incredibly complicated, which it was. But they were, their initial response to it was to try to write their own bill, which they did write, there was a Republican bill, but then support for that collapsed, support for the Democratic bill collapsed, and that's, and you could for a period of time talk about the two parties' approach to this subject, right? And then it just disappeared, and there just isn't a Republican approach. You know, they, they, there was exactly one legislative accomplishment in the Trump presidency, and it's the same legislative accomplishment in every Republican presidency since Reagan, which is he cut taxes. That's it, and there's nothing else. That's it. What can be done with MSNBC and CNN being compared to the left version of Fox? I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't. Uh, it's. I, I don't care about it. it. It's nonsense. You know. It's. It's. A, it's a flat Earth society over there at Fox, and um, it has nothing to do with the news business. And it was Rupert's, you know, clever idea to call it Fox News, so that he could force you to call it Fox News. That's semantic infiltration. That is semantically infiltrating the way the other side speaks so that we force them to say what we want them to say, okay? It has nothing to do with news. It's just a Fox business. It's just a Fox racket of some kind. Does and that, it's I'm utter sorry. nonsense. It has nothing to do with any form of fact, no form of fact at all. Uh, and so, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say about people who can't see what that is. Well, would it, if I said to you that my sense is that MSNBC at night tilts left, would you say, oh no, that's just misperception? No, I know, I'd say I know what you mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I'd, I'd invite, certainly for my hour, for anyone to point out what I got wrong. You know, like what was the, what was the factual misstatement? And, and I think, you know, it's a very clear space in my hour and most of the hours of, of all cable news other than Fox, it's a very clear space what the difference is between you know, this declaration or this presentation of facts here, this presentation, this, this section where it veers off into either prediction or you know, uh, you know, some form of guesswork, 
I mean, I'll t here's an example of something that's pure guesswork, right? And, um, and no one really found fault with it. It wasn't really news. If you look at the ramp up to the Putin invasion uh, of Ukraine, the one question that I absolutely refused to ask on TV was, what do you think's going to happen? Uh -huh. Because I thought every second after that is a complete waste of time. And that was the dominant question through a lot of no, the CNN coverage and MSNBC coverage, everything, right? And so, mm -hmm. but no one faults that. Nobody says, oh, you know, that's, you know, that, that's kind of a soft area. Um, but, but what was accurate in all of those presentations that preceded that question was this is what happened today, this is what Zelensky said today, this is what Putin didn't say, this is how the, this is what the meeting with Macron looked like at the silly table. All that was the fact space. Uh, and so if you look at the fact space that is presented, you know, in a CNN presentation or an MSNBC presentation, before you get into the discussion space, all of that stuff is real. All of that stuff is true. Well, my and feeling, if I may, and I'm talking now about, about CNN more, is that during the Trump era, uh, basically, it, it, you know, they have the most powerful news organization in the world in terms of resources. Mm -hmm. And they spent all their time with panels of 10 people telling me about how terrible Trump was. And at one point, I said, okay, stipulated as the lawyer, say, we get that. Now, why don't you tell us what's going on? That was my view of it. But I can't endorse enough, and I take some pride in telling you that during my years, at, at, particularly at CNN, my answer to the question was, I don't know. Right, right. And it, it's, it was the hardest thing to get people, it's I almost, you know, don't it's kinda, know. And it's kind of a trick answer, so to speak. You know, we all think about trick questions. The trick answer in these kinds of shows is to say that, and I personally believe that that should be, if I hope it is, a winning answer with the audience, meaning uh, that y the respect level for that guest doesn't decline. I, because when you say, what is Putin going to do? And the person says, I don't know. That should be the person you continue to listen to yeah, instead mean, of the other ones you know, who are doing was, the guesswork. I, mean, I got some satisfaction in just doing it and watching one of the anchors kind of Right. What, what's that? Right. Well, it's because I, I don't know. Um, why don't no, you really throw off the anchor's rhythm, though. I've got to say that. If someone said, I don't know, that would really throw off my rhythm. Because I'm counting on them to talk for a couple of minutes <laughs> after I ask right. a question. It's like, I, I need a little It's very break. much like in a debate when you know, you're asked a question, and instead of the talking, you just go, no. Right. And then now it's the next guy's turn who's yeah. still trying to remember what his consultant told yeah. him to say. Yeah. Why it's don't very, it's an old-fashioned political uh, judo. technique? Too. I, I call uh, it the judo. only the only presidential candidate in the last campaign who said a one-word answer to debate questions a couple of times was Joe Biden. It's a very old. He, yeah. he just said nope, and everybody was kind of. It was the clarity of it was perfect. Everyone was shocked by the rhythm of it, and it undercut his reputation as a right. windbag. Right. Why don't Democrats point out that at any given time the oil price will be the price that clears the market? I yeah, there's that. There's that. <laughs> it's uh, it, yeah, the idea that the president sets the gas price is just madness. Uh, at least since you know Roosevelt did it during World War II, uh, you know, and and along with fixing the price, uh, you were limited to buying four gallons a week if you owned a car, and uh, it, you know, imagine that today. Imagine uh, th this country going along with you know that kind of. Well, we had it. We had it in '73 and '79. We had alternate. You could only buy gas if your license plate ended in an even or odd number. Yeah, but you could buy as much as they would sell you. Uh, which, you know? which, well, which, 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 because of the gas crisis, was the only thing that was yeah. determining how much they would pump. It wasn't the government saying what. But the answer, doing. I think, the real answer to this question is that is for a great majority of Americans, what, you, what this question says is incomprehensible. Right. It's un what, are you, what are you talking about? Clears them. What is that? I, I think, I think the difference between people pulling up at the pump and looking at those numbers. And then a, a, a thoughtful trip home saying, well, you know, it, this really isn't a political decision. It's for the price of oil clearing the, the market. Well, I, do, I mean, I do think it's, a, it's kind of a minimal request uh, for people who are going to participate in this democracy uh, at this point in the 21st century to have some sense of how an oil price ends up being an oil price. Oh, and, yes. and, you know, this is American high school's problem because 
they're still using the curriculum from you know uh, too long ago instead of making economics one year of it mandatory, uh, which we don't. Okay, you know, I this, the, the cynical part of me, and it's been true for a very long time, is you know we haven't taught civics in a long time. Uh, the um, the amount of misinformation. I mean, of the kind you're talking about, QAnon kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That a, a, a significant portion of the electorate is prepared to either believe or say, well, maybe there's something to that. Well, it, well it, the funny thing is, it's only a significant portion of the electorate. I'm going to come back to this. It's only that because of the Electoral College. That's the only reason. If you distribute those people in the right states at the right time and you're lucky in the roll of the dice, it works, uh, but it wouldn't be in a real democracy. They wouldn't be significant because the Democrat would win by you know five million no. votes, and everybody would forget you know what that election was about. So they'd win the Congress. Hmm? They'd win the Congress. Well, the Congress is more complicated okay. than the gerrymandering and all of that. You know? um, excuse me. You saw the numbers from gerrymandering. It turns out the Democrats are going to pick up a seat or two because of that. For all of the, the rending of garments, yeah, no. or yeah. as, as we are in the 90 seconds, why the Geshrine, oh my God, the gerrymandering is going to kill us. They're going to actually do better. They might. At least until they the might. Supreme Court gets around. Anyway, yeah. this is another subject. But here's the last question, and it's... Um, I, I don't gonna, deny equal incentives on both sides on gerrymandering. Yeah, uh, that's historically always been true. As somebody said to me, we got the we got the votes. We get to put the crayons on the map. Right. Um, I think that's you know not mm-hmm. not the most high-minded way to put it. I think Phil Burton, when he ran the California system, would sit in a bar with the map of California, literally, and draw it out. And he was a liberal Democrat. Okay, so he, you're going to like this. I think this is fun for you. If Putin came into town <laughs> and agreed to pe- appear on political talk shows for a day. First, would you book him? Second, what's the one uh, question you would ask him, assuming he doesn't get angry and storm off? So let's take the first one. Would you book, Vladimir Putin says, I'm coming to America, want to do O'Donnell show. <laughs> yes, no? That would, that would be a very good night, yeah. Okay. I'd, uh, so. I'd give him at least two seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's very uh, generous of you. Absolutely. Okay, what would you ask him? Oh uh, boy, that's so difficult. Um, I would ask him, why has Russian imperialism always failed? And by fail, I mean, yes, you invade the country. Yes, you install somebody. Yep, you got the Russian tanks in there. But 20 years later, you don't. Uh, 30 years later, whenever it is, you know, and throughout their history, they have this. Mm-hmm. They have this manifest destiny, their version of it, you know, to their, uh, you know, to, to their eastern front. And, um, and by the way, their western front, that expanded over time. And, um, and they never hold it. You know, I, I know, you know, the Berlin Wall, when, I, when the Berlin Wall was up for 28 years, 28 years, okay? And in the 27th year of the Berlin Wall, it's, it felt like it would be up there for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Like, why wouldn't it? What would ever change, right? Uh, months before it came down, it felt mm-hmm. like it would be up there forever. And so, that, so there's this Russian dictatorial uh, attachment to this concept that they can do this and that they can grab this and grab this land and grab it violently if necessary and hold it and it becomes Russia. And it never works. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, you know, because when you do that and you have a war over it and you kill people, it's supposed to last forever. It's not supposed to last for 28 years or, you know, 20 years or, uh, and it never works and, and they never tire of it. I'd love to hear Putin's reason That's the for reason. why it has always failed. The reason why that's so such a great question is there's an interview in The New Yorker this week with a Russian expert. I don't know his name because it's not my turf. But he makes precisely that point. It goes back hundreds of years. It's always the same manifest destiny. Oh. They can be communists. They can be anti-communists. They can be czarists. They can be theocrats. It's always the same impulse and it never works. That's so, that, you know, that's such a smarter question that I would ask him, which is, 
How tall are you really? <laughs> well, that's good because you get them to lie right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. You, know, um, you know, on the Berlin Wall, um, Senator Moynihan, who I know a lot of you voted for uh, and who I loved and loved working for, is the only person I know who predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he did it in a Newsweek column in around 1978 or so, something like that. And all the money we poured into the CIA, they never predicted it. Uh, it collapsed without them knowing that it was going to collapse. He did it on the basis of his uh, scholarly uh, expertise and work uh, on ethnic rivalries and ethnic friction. Uh, he wrote Beyond the Melting Pot with Nathan Glazer about uh, the ethnicities of New York City. Uh, and how they got along together and how they didn't and all of that. And so he, he was using his experience as uh, ambassador to the United Nations, uh, ambassador to India, his foreign policy experience, and all of his uh, you know, Harvard professor scholarship about uh, people holding together as a society, predicting it'll just collapse under its own weight. And what he used to say is, you know, the CIA has no idea you know, what's going on on the other side of that Berlin Wall you know, but if you ask any cab driver in Berlin, you know, what's going to happen, they will all tell you this, this can't last, and here's why it can't last. CIA just wasn't talking to cab drivers. I think you folks who at home and in the audience now know why I am so delighted that the first return post-pandemic to talk politics is Lawrence O'Donnell. My pleasure. Oh, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So great to see you. Thank you.